911, what is your emergency? Um, we need someone here at the Columbia Daily Tribune. What's going on? I'm, I'm not sure. I was just told to call 911. There's somebody hurt outside. Is there anybody who can tell me what's going on there? Uh, here. We're at the main building of the Tribune. And what's going on? In the parking lot, the sports editor, Kent, laying on the ground. Pool of blood. Looks like he's been shot or something. Okay, he's on the parking lot behind the Tribune on the KFC side? Yes, yes. Who did you see in the area? I saw two guys in the area. Were they white or black? White. I'd say 1920. What were they wearing? I, I don't know this gal. She saw them. She walked out to okay. smoke a cigarette. Saw them duck down behind the car. Okay. I looked out and saw them, and I said, what's going on? I knew it was Kent's car, and I said, Kent? And they didn't look up. Nobody did anything. Somebody's been hurt, man. Okay, so you saw them duck down behind his car? Yes. Okay, and then where did they go after that? I don't know, up, up towards the new building, uh, towards 4th Street. I guess that's 4th. So, just to make sure, though, he's down on the parking lot? Yes. And then all on these guys? I don't, because okay. well, they, they, they were close to 6 feet uh, thin. One of them had blonde hair, really, really short blonde hair. Did they either one of them have hats or caps? They were headed towards 4th Street, so that would have been east or? I'd say southeast but I don't know that for sure because they took off, you know, and they went up that alleyway towards 4th. All right, we've got officers on the way over there right now. All right, we'll be out there. Okay. Bye. Bye. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me is a guy that less than two weeks ago, the mayor of Indianapolis gave him the key to the city. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Bobber Lager by the brilliant minds over at Log Boat Brewing Company in beautiful Columbia, Missouri. Garage Grade, you know I love a good lager, especially in the warm months, and this is a great one. So Garage Grade, let's go four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. Bobber is an unfiltered lager brewed with inspiration from pale German lagers. And the noble hops provide a little bitterness, and my favorite part, Bobber has a crisp, clean finish. I was on their website the other day, and you know, sometimes a brewer will recommend food pairings with different beers. And for Bobber Lager, they recommend deer sausage. And this lager is brought to us by these little fishes. First up, we have Natalie from Grand Ledge, Michigan, who says, please give the beers to the captain because I think I have the hots for him. Mm. Well, look at that, Captain. You still got it, buddy, all these years. Never had it. Next, we have Brianna and Brandon in South Dakota. We also have Aaron, who is a web sleuther turned private investigator in Fort Meade, Maryland. That's the old crab cake state. And a big we like your jib to Kendra up in Ontario, Canada. And we also have Meredith sending love from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm, I've been to Hot Pants. I've never been to Hot Springs. We also give a shout out to Laquell in the Bronx. And last but not least, we have John from Western Massachusetts. He recommends Spencer Trappist Ale, and he says, obviously... Here, quoting Ferris Bueller, it is so choice. If you have the means, I highly recommend picking some up. Do you have a kiss for your daddy? So thank you to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week. And if you want to buy us around for next week's show, please go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And if you want to check out everything with True Crime, go to the website. We also have some shirts. We have the purple V-necks. We have the team captain tank tops coming out. And then we have the gray logos for the men. So check those out. All orders are shipped on Friday. I must protest here. I, it sounds like there's no Team Nick shirt. Yeah, well, we're working on a Team Colonel shirt. It's like a team of one over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This is True Crime Garage. 
and this is the case of Ryan Ferguson. How many times did you think he hit him all together? Just once. Just once? The only problem I have with that is I know that he was hit more than once. Right? Like, I just hit him once. You just hit him once? You didn't hit him more than no. like because 10 I, times? Because I just need to remember the first time that I hit him, I remember hearing this noise and it just and just seeing his face and it just made me sick. If you only hit him once, turn away and got sick, you had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it though. I mean, I don't know okay. either that or I stopped and he did, I don't know. Did you ever drop the pipe? Probably. Did you hand it off to Ryan? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Let's go back to when you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Now, we know what the guy got strangled with. That's kind of the thing I've been holding back from you. Uh -huh. All right. Is it possible that you know what he was struggling with and just didn't want to tell you? Because I, I know. I, no, was. like I think it was a shirt or something. Or okay, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. It's was like uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't something from his car. I don't okay. see why he'd have a rope in his car. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was struggling with his belt. Really? Yeah. Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope maybe or a bungee cord? I don't know. So it's possible Ryan could have struggled this guy with his belt. You got the keys and you not. With the guy is the man's belt? Yeah. His own belt? Yes. Does that ring a bell? Not at all. Like, I didn't. But you saw Ryan scrambling though. I thought, yeah. Yeah, okay. You said it's earlier or something about Ryan's. Ryan wanted to choke him down to make sure he was dead. Is that true? I think that he was like, yeah. Ryan Ferguson was convicted of the murder of Kent Heitholt. Kent's murder took place in the early morning hours of November 1st, 2001, in Ryan Ferguson's hometown of Columbia, Missouri. At the time of the murder, Ferguson was only 17 years old. He was a junior in high school. Kent Heitholt was found beaten and strangled shortly after 2 a.m. on November 1st, 2001, in the parking lot of the Columbia Daily Tribune. Kent worked there as a sports editor. The murder went unsolved for two years until police received a tip that a man, this is Charles Erickson, he was extremely drunk that night and he could not remember some of the events that took place that evening mm -hmm. and most of what took place around the time of the actual murder. After reading newspaper articles, Charles Erickson was having dreams about the murder. He told a couple of people that he had concerns that he may have been involved in the actual murder. One, well, and Chuck had a drug problem as well. Correct. Charles Erickson was partying with Ryan Ferguson on Halloween night, October 31st. Now, this would be Wednesday night, but we all know how much everyone likes to party on Halloween. Charles and Ryan, they were doing quite a bit of underage drinking at a bar that night. Mm -hmm. And a party that had started in the evening earlier turned into partying into the early morning hours. Charles, or Chuck Erickson, would later confess to the murder of Kent Heitholt and implicate Ryan Ferguson in the murder as well. Ryan Ferguson was convicted in the fall of 2005. And what you can hear in that trailer is the interrogation of Chucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was kind of a, what we just went through is a summarized version of the case, which we usually don't go through that and summarize the case mm -hmm. for you before we so go now they can just stop listening yeah you, now done. you know everything all right see you guys next week well we usually don't do that before we go through it in detail mm -hmm. but we wanted to do that because with this case it, it's it's actually very important that persons not familiar with this case have that information because when it comes to ryan ferguson not only was his innocence or guilt called into question before he was convicted but both were called into question years after his conviction which ultimately would lead to appeals trials, and then Ryan Ferguson's conviction was vacated in November of 2013. So I just wanted everybody to be aware of that situation fully before we go through the detailed account of what took place the evening of October 31st and the early morning hours of November 1st, 2001. 
So each of you can make a little mental note of when you think of, you know, at some points or some things might point towards Ryan's guilt or if it would point towards his innocence. Yeah, don't, don't you tell me what to do. Okay, let's go through a detailed account of that night. And first, we'll go through the police slash prosecutor story of that evening as what they pieced together off of eyewitness accounts and the confessor. This is Charles or Chuck Erickson, and we'll call him Chuck from now on. I'll call him Chucky. There you go. On the evening of October 31st, 2001, as we said, many people were out celebrating Halloween. This including students from both of the city's two high schools. We will start the evening off roughly in the time frame of about 9 to 10 p.m. There are several Halloween parties going on, and the ones we are talking about have both high school age kids and young adults just out of high school at these parties. Ryan Ferguson is party hopping that evening, and as the night goes on, he's getting ready to leave a party, and he sees Chuck Erickson, who, as we said, he knows him from school. Right. Some have reported that Ryan and Chuck were hanging out that night together. Others report that Ryan offered Chuck a ride as he was leaving the party. I think either way actually works. Uh, it's not really important, so however it comes about, they are riding together in Ryan's car. Ryan tells Chuck... Well, and let's get this clear, too, because a lot of people report like that they're buddies. Kind of like in the West Memphis 3 case, where it's like, yeah, they're, you know, two of them were buddies, and one was just kind of an acquaintance. In this scenario, uh, Ryan and Chucky, they're just acquaintances. Yeah, they know each other from school. They're the same age. They probably have a couple classes together. Mm -hmm. But from everything that I could gather, you're exactly right, Captain. They, they doesn't sound like they were they were not best friends. They they really didn't even hang out a whole lot. Together. Almost the opposite sides of the track. I mean, he, we have an individual with Ryan that seems to be heavily involved in sports. Um, you know, involved with his family and a lot of friends. And it seems like Chucky is uh, kind of on the slacker side. Mm -hmm. And they ran in the same circles, but the circle wasn't just the two of them. It was you know, many friends that they had. Right. Anyway, so regardless of how they end up in Ryan's vehicle, but they're in his car, and at some point, either before the ride or during the ride, Ryan says to to Chuck, you know, hey, uh, let's go to this club. My older sister is at a club, and she can get us in, and we can continue to party. You know, mm -hmm. we'll go there and have a few drinks, right? Okay, sounds great. So the two underage 17-year-old boys out looking for a good time they meet up with Ryan's sister. Well, and they're going to meet up at a bar called uh, By George. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> Such a dumb name for a bar. Well, Sorry if you own that bar, and I'm talking about it. But Or if your name is George. I don't, I don't mind the name George. I'm just saying By George is a, kind of a dumb name for a bar. Chuck Erickson states that the, the two spent up what money that they had once they were at the bar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then Ryan's sister bought a drink or two for them, and then the two left, you know, because they were out of money. Once outside, Ryan is calling people on his cell phone. Now, I couldn't gather why Ryan was calling a bunch of different people, but I'm going to guess that Erickson, that Chuck would have said possibility that, that, that Ryan was looking for someone with money to either join them at by George's right. or looking for another place to go party. Because what Chuck Erickson would say is that Ryan... Ryan said next would imply that Ryan was not done partying for the night. So with, okay. with no one left to call, Ryan tells Chuck, hey, man, let's go rob someone so we can get enough money to get back into the bar and have some more drinks. Bef All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, here's a plan. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it happens every weekend. How many times you're at a bar and your buddy says, let's go rob somebody so we can drink more? Well, before they leave Ryan's car, they take a like a tire iron or one of those tire changing tools that come in the trunk of your car. Mm -hmm. uh, they take this item, and so they walk to find their potential robbery or mugging victim. Uh, well, they spot 48-year-old Kent Heitholt. Kent, as we had said, Kent is working late at the Columbia Daily Tribune. Uh, this would be approximately at 2.15 a.m. or so. Now, I do want to point out here that several people were working at the Columbia Daily Tribune that night, uh, early morning hours, whatever you want to call it. And the, the times, well, most of the times we give during this detailed account are going to be more approximate times. 
uh, for most of this stuff. We do not have exact times. For one reason, we have our main witness, which is Chuck Erickson, who ends up confessing to being a part of the crime, mm-hmm. implicating Ryan Ferguson. Chuck had fully admitted he was so drunk and high that night uh, that that he had been drinking, doing Adderall and cocaine that night. So quite the concoction <laughs> inside of him. Well, damn, uh, Chuck, he slowed down. And, well, he admits to being so messed up that he cannot remember most of the night. So there's one reason of not having exact mm-hmm. times. But what we will figure out here is that almost, you know, almost in the same breath that I say that, I'll point out that we do know that these times from the other eyewitnesses are close or somewhat accurate because we are dealing with such a small window of time that they have to be close, okay? Mm -hmm. So how do we know Ryan and Chuck spot Kent at approximately 2.15 a.m.? Well, Michael Boyd, he is another employee of the Daily Tribune. He's working. He's a writer, a part-time writer. He says he left work sometime before Kent Heitholt did. Mm -hmm. And he knows this because he left around 2 a.m. And on his way out, he stops and he has a short conversation with Mike Henry. He's a night custodian at the at the Tribune. Mm-hmm. Michael Boyd walks the parking lot and he gets to his car. He will have to actually pass Kent's car to get to his own car. Then he goes out to his car and when he's out there, he sits there for a little bit of time listening to some music when he sees Kent leaving work and going out to his car. To leave for the night. All right, why would you just get in your car and, and listen to music for uh, a while before you leave? It, it seems strange to me at that hour. Right. You know, especially at that hour. Uh, Michael pulls his car up alongside of Kent's, and they have a discussion. According to Michael Boyd, this conversation, it's a work conversation. It takes place sometime between 2.12 2 12 a.m., sorry, and 2.20 a.m. Mm-hmm. Michael Boyd says, after the conversation... He leaves in his car, and he's, he goes to drive home. As he's pulling out and into the alley, he says that he nearly hit someone. He sees two people in the parking lot. Right. Uh, this is not Kent. Kent is not one of the people that he's describing here. He sees yo- younger people, right? Well, uh, Or to, does, does he not make that claim? To be clear, all he says is that he sees, Michael sees two people, and he cannot tell if the people are male or female. Okay. Uh, so basically, so, right. no description of right. the people. Anomalies, almost. Yeah, so these two people could be Chuck and Ryan because they would have to have have arrived sometime in this time frame to the parking lot at the Columbia Daily Tribune. Mm-hmm. And you'll see why here in a minute. So the attack would go something like this. Kent would be hit in the head or neck area about 11 or 12 times with some unknown object or the tire tool, as Chuck had said. Right. Then as the victim, Kent, is down on all fours from the blows he just took, someone, you know, and that someone, according to Chuck, is Ryan, pulls the victim's belt off. Mm -hmm. Now, he would have had to have done this, according to the police, by by pulling up from the left hand side. You know, from, from like reaching around from behind Kent, on the left side and grabbing the belt and pulling it up and off. Right. They came to this conclusion because two of the belt loops on the left side of Kent's pants were ripped or torn off. Then using the victim's own belt, Ryan Ferguson strangled. Okay. Hold on a second. So you're saying that they believe that the belt was ripped off of him because there was two, because the belt loops were broken Two two of his belt loops were, were ripped. Okay. Then using the victim's own belt, Ryan Ferguson strangled Kent Heitholt. A very short time before 2.26 a.m., a custodian, this is her name is Shauna Ornt, she stepped outside for a cigarette break or to walk some trash to the dumpster. Now, Or both. Yeah, my understanding is that sometimes a smoke break and walking trash to the dumpster are the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Great reporting there. There you go. Happened at the same time. Right. Anyway, she is out there and she she sees two shadowy figures right. near Kent's car. She ran back inside to get her coworker. This is Jerry Trump. She's telling him that there is something going on in the parking lot and she wanted him to go out there and see what it was. He doesn't really want to do this, but he gives in and he agrees to go check it out. 
So now the two of them, well, they are standing, they're standing at one of those like, um, you know, kind of like a large overhead door. You know, they're standing just past the opening of that. Okay. And at first they don't see anything, you know, uh, you know, Jerry Trump's probably like, oh, great. I agreed to come out here and check out this thing. You're just, you're just freaking out for nothing. There's nothing going on out here. They don't see anything. Yeah, but they sometimes don't... that's scarier is when somebody says, I see somebody outside and then you go and you start looking and you go, I, I see nothing. But sometimes that the, the you're not as relieved. Mm-hmm. Well, they see nothing at first. They hear nothing at first. Mm hmm. So Jerry Trump decides, he, he yells out something like, you know, I see you, you might as well come out, you might as well stand up or something like that. Put your hands up. Yeah. And two individuals stand up, and one of them is at the front of Kent's car, near the front of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. The other one is at the rear of the vehicle. So both both custodians witness two, what they, what they report as white college-age men now standing near Kent Heitholt's vehicle. They also both said that the man at the rear of the vehicle, he walked to the front of the car and said something to the effect of, you know, this guy is hurt out here or you better call someone, you better get call an ambulance, something like that, that this, this guy's hurt and he needs help. So what you're saying is that these two, two employees of the newspaper Mm-hmm. See these two individuals in the du- parking lot, ducking down, possibly hiding behind Kent's car, mm-hmm. and then one of them kind of walks from the back of the car to the front, and then says, "Hey, you better call an ambulance. This guy's hurt out here." Yeah, he says something like, "Get help. This guy's hurt." Now, that's something you probably wouldn't say if you hurt the guy. Um, yeah, I, d- I don't know. It's it's a ve- it's a strange situation, regardless. Uh, right. If you but if you're gonna take somebody's belt off put it around their throat and pull as hard as you can. So they stop breathing. I don't think you're asking somebody to call an ambulance. No, you want that guy dead for some reason. Yeah. You don't want him to be able to come to and, and give information about you. Right. Uh, according to the police report, the employees called nine one one at two twenty six AM. Right. Which uh, we heard that nine one one call at the beginning. So if, if you want to hear it again, go back to the beginning. Some of the other uh, sport reporters working that night uh, came running out to see what was going on, and they found 46-year-old Kent Heitholt lying face down at the rear of his car. Now, they rolled him over, and they tried to resuscitate him, and of course, unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, The police department was within just a few blocks of the newspaper's parking lot and the newspaper's building, so they arrived very quickly. Uh, when they got there, they saw Kent had been severely beaten with some kind of blunt object, and he was strangled and dead at this point. Well, and we we both took a look at the autopsy, but and we're not going to go over it in a bunch of details because it's pretty simple to summarize. But they keep talking about this blunt object and being hit well over ten times. Um, you even hear this in the interrogation with the police and and Chucky. Mm-hmm. But they keep talking about a blunt uh, object, but there's no skull fractures. Correct. There's they don't find any skull fractures on Kent Heitholt. Um, so and, so it's death by strangulation. His hyoid bone is broken. Yeah. And there's a little there's a little conjecture. There's a little back and forth on uh, the hyoid bone being broken as well. There's one expert that says that he believes the hyoid bone was could have been broken because of he because he was hit. He was hit about the the head and neck area. Um, but mm-hmm. the original the original expert believes that the hyoid bone was broken during the strangulation process. I don't think that that is necessarily important. I think the most important thing that I see in the autopsy itself is, like you said, the number of times that, that Kent is hit with. They keep referring to it as a blunt object. Right. Uh, but like you said, no skull fracture. So to me, it's more of. Uh, he's hit 11 or 12 times with an unknown object. Right. But wh- what was that expert telling you that one time? Uh, like a, you take a 10 year old girl yeah, with, with a bat or something and, and there's going to be skull fractures. Th- actually, this is, it wasn't something that somebody told me. It was um, a comment that was made to Ryan Ferguson's father to okay. Bill Ferguson. Uh, that he reported elsewhere, stating that, you know, it, it was strange that there was no skull fractures because an expert, quote unquote, an expert, according to Bill Ferguson, had told him that a 12 year old girl with a baseball bat 
if she hits somebody 11, 12, or 50, even 15 times, you're going to have several skull fractures, not right. just one. You're going to have, you're going to, you're going to get a, a few out of that. So he's hit with some kind of unknown object. We'll, we'll call it that. Right. And he doesn't, so he's not going to make it. Right. And at this point, Chuck Erickson claims that he and Ryan, after having murdered Kent, mm -hmm. that they take this kind of, this very kind of roundabout way of walking back to the bar. But before they get there, this is at approximately 2.30 a.m., they are at an intersection, and there is a car there stopped at a red light. Uh, and inside the car, well, this, this is somebody uh, that the two boys know, and his name is Dallas Mallory. Dallas is in a car with two young ladies. Mm -hmm. Dallas is actually about two years older, I believe, than, play than, play than play Chuck and Ryan. Well, Chuck Erickson has a short conversation with Dallas Mallory at the at the red light. Yeah, and Chucky says, "How are you in the truck with two women?" <laughs> That's what he asks. Well, the the uh, the light eventually turns green, and away <laughs> Dallas and the two girls go. Right. right. So so now it's back to by George's for Chuck and Ryan. And we'll get right back to the case of Ryan Ferguson after this quick beer break. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers. So after Ryan and Chuck commit this murder, they, according to Chuck, they go out with the motive of robbery. They attack Kent Heitholt. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kill him in the parking lot. Now they've taken this roundabout way of making their way back to the bar and they're back at by George's. According to Chuck, they get back to the bar around two 45 AM and they stay there drinking, dancing, having a good time until about four to four 15 AM in the morning. Well, these bars are open pretty late. And this only makes sense, right? Because we we saw this with the uh, with the Casey Anthony thing, right? Right? You know, when when you kill somebody, uh, the best way to celebrate is to go to a bar and dance and party and have a good time. You know, okay. so now now, <laughs> now while the two of them are off having a good time, right. the police have a murder and a crime scene to deal with here. So the police are going to do a canine search. And I won't go through all of the street names, but basically the police dog is going to track slash follow the trail of the perpetrators and the dog leads them in the opposite direction as to where Chuck Erickson says that they are going to go. Of course, the dog, mm. the dog chase does not turn up the perpetrators. And we do have another problem here with this crime scene. The Tribune's parking lot. Well, it has two, Two security cameras, and okay. these security cameras are very obvious. You know, they're the type that would be up on the building, and if you were walking by, they weren't hidden cameras. You know, you would you would notice them from the street and be aware that the parking lot is under surveillance. Right. However, you know, we unfortunately we see this time and time again in these situations. Th these cameras are not working on this night. Oh, really? Yeah. So the police really have no leads other than the description that they're given from the two custodians, that they are looking for two Caucasian college age dudes uh, per the description given to them. Short hair, one maybe blonde, mm -hmm. spiked up in the front. And they, do a, uh, they do a drawing of the, this at least one of the individuals. Well, yeah, this is Shauna Ornt and Jerry Trump, the, the employees at the Daily Tribune. Um, we should point out here that early in the investigation, Jerry Trump's statements were deemed as useless by the police. Okay. As his description that he gave to them, it was so vague that it really provided them nothing of value. You know, he basically says, I, I, I really couldn't see anything. I really right. couldn't see anything to describe these guys. Now, as you had mentioned, Shauna Ornt, uh, on the other hand, uh, with the with the police department's use of what they call like an identity kit or an ID kit, right. uh, they come up with a composite sketch of the guy uh, who walked from the rear of the vehicle to the front of Kent Heitholt's car. You know, the the guy telling them to get well, help. Right, and Shauna is she's younger. Yes. And so we, let's just assume she has better eyes. 
And uh, Trump, I think she was what eighteen or nineteen at the time when she saw the. Saw yeah, she's pretty down. young, and and Trump and Trump was quite a bit older at the time. Yes. Um, now, basically, the way that they come up with this composite drawing, it's it's that old school identi kit, um, and in some places they may call it something different. But basically, what they do is, Captain, they'll show you. They have like a flip book, and they're like, they'll show you a bunch of different sets of eyes, and you're like. Oh, that mm. looks like his eyes. And they're like, okay, they they set those eyes on the face. And then they flip through the book more and they show you a nose. I'm like, oh, yeah, that looks like his nose. And yeah. and so you piece together the person's face. Well, and the problem with this drawing is, again, it's happening very late at night or in the early mornings. It's very dark out, very low lighting. So, and then if, and actually I would say, you know, like during, if it was during the day, obviously you'd be, it'd be easier to identify somebody. I think it would be way harder to do this identical kit when there's heavy shadows mm-hmm. from the street lights. Well, I agree. And I don't know that it was fully like, as far as the way I heard the parking lot described, I'm sure there are dark spots and dark areas. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Shauna states that when she saw the, well, the man that she was able to come up with the composite drawing of that, that was, she believed to be a, what she considered a well lit portion of, of the park. Right. Lot. Again, but you're going to have these hard shadows. Oh, you, of and, course. Cause all the lights are coming from above. And if you watch any of the documentaries on, on this case, it's, you know, you can see how dark that, that area would have been. Yeah. And to go with the composite drawing, um, you know, she describes the guy as a Caucasian male, about six foot tall, 200 pounds, uh, muscular build wearing a white t-shirt and has possibly has short blonde hair. Now, some other things while we are talking about the crime scene, there was a blood trail, which makes sense because we have a victim that was beaten in the head. Mm -hmm. You would expect a a certain amount of blood. So there was a blood trail, but this went in again in a different direction than what Chuck said he and Ryan had fled the scene. Police found a hair either in or on the hand of the victim. This would be collected uh, and and later tested. They did not find the blunt object, or as Chuck had said, the tire tool uh, used to beat Kent. Uh, They did not find that at the crime scene. They did find the belt buckle, Kent's belt buckle. It had broken off and was lying there near uh, near Kent. Mm -hmm. They found fingerprints not matching the victim in and on the victim's vehicle. Uh, and, and one more thing though, the, the police found no evidence to suggest Kent had been robbed. Um, so keep in mind, you're trying know, to find the motive. Right? Yeah. They're, they're going to check the victim and try to come up with why would this guy be attacked? Well, they don't see any obvious signs that, that robbery was the motive for this, te- this attack or murder. So at this point they are looking for two young white dudes mm-hmm. and they don't have a motive to go on at this point in their investigation. Well, and so we go to the following day the mm-hmm. we, I call this the hangover day. I mean, we got two individuals that were 17 years old. They went partying. Uh, Chucky was doing a blow mm-hmm. drinking, doing some Adderall. Uh, and he claims that he doesn't remember anything of the events the night before. Yeah. He has no memory of Halloween night. Uh, and also, you know, as we said, there, there was nothing other than probably one heck of, of the, a hangover, like the captain pointed out, that anything had went wrong or anything terrible had happened that night. Chuck did not notice anything unusual. He, he didn't have any injuries. Uh, he didn't have any blood on his clothing. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about Chuck for, for a minute, though. Okay. okay. Um, you know, as we had said earlier, he's the same age as Ryan. 17 at the time of this murder and a high school student. Uh, but, but one big different thing here is, you know, Ryan liked the party, obviously, like, like some high school students do. However, Chuck had a bit of a history. He had a, he had a reputation for blacking out right. and a history and a reputation for getting really blitzed, you know, whether it being drinking or drugs or both. Um, and he would from time to time do, something bad or embarrassing. You know, he would destroy, he was known to destroy property or to get in fights. Right. Um, and then typically the next day he would have little 
to no memory of these events or the things that he had did. Well, then people would tell him what he had done. And sometimes these memories, well, they would start to come back to him and maybe sometimes they would not. But it's my understanding that he had such a reputation for this kind of behavior that often he was not invited to parties because nobody wanted him around. Yeah, you know, nobody they, wants the nobody wants the douche canoe breaking furniture. Right, you don't want that fights. You don't want that guy at your house. That's first not a of party. All. Yeah, because you're going to get busted by your parents if this guy destroys something. Mm-hmm. Second of all, you don't want him there if he's going to pick fights with your friends. Uh, getting you know getting drunk, destroying stuff, and just being basically a walking party foul right. is is what Chuck Erickson would be. Chucky, okay. <laughs> Chucky, aka party foul, Erickson. So let's. Okay, before we fast forward, let's go through what happened that night, according to Ryan. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so we we need to be clear about this. Okay. All the reports that you were just giving, the fine, beautiful people listening to the show, all the reports that you're giving are are just from from Chucky, but also from the police. Correct. It's basically Mm -hmm. the, the... this, the general story that the prosecutor slash police pieced together about what took place that night. Right, but like we all know, there's three sides to every story. Mm-hmm. Well, according according to Ryan, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I didn't want to mix the two stories because not only are they very different, but uh, well, let's say uh, the night and the way things went down, according to Ryan, let's say it was much less eventful. Um, according to Ryan Ferguson, he and Chuck did go to the bar. They went to buy George's. Uh, they met his sister there. They had drinks. Um, they left the bar at 1.30 a.m. So we're already seeing a difference in time here. Right. Ryan drove Chuck to Chuck's home. And then Ryan continued on to his own home, arriving at his family's house around 1.40 a.m. So very a very quick drive from by George's to get Chuck home. And then Ryan takes himself home. Then in the early morning hours, after he gets home, uh, from one forty one AM to two Oh nine AM, mm-hmm. Ryan calls several friends and then he goes to bed. He's having murdered no one that evening, uh, being, and actually being according to his account, right. And he's we- at home at his family's home during the time of Kent height Holt's murder. Yeah. Okay. So we got two completely different stories. Mm-hmm. Well, in one story, we got two murderers, and the other story, we got a guy dropping. A, you know, I dropped my buddy off. We had a couple <laughs> drinks, dropped him off, and dropping his really drunk buddy off. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, right. Yeah. Not just drunk, but high too. So. How about how about we fast forward here, Captain? So let's let's fast forward Get to the DeLorean. Two thousand and three. Now, by this time, the murder it, it remained an unsolved mystery. You know, in October of 2003, the local media again began, they were covering the story. They were covering the murder. And Chuck Erickson reportedly had several dreams about the crime after seeing an an article in a newspaper. And he couldn't get over the fact that he had been so close in proximity to where someone had been murdered at about the same time. Right. And he had almost no memory of that night. Well, right, because he has that history of blacking out. Mm-hmm. And about a month later or so, Chuck, he, he, he read another article in the, in the local newspaper, but this one included a sketch, the sketch of the possible suspect in the case. Uh, remember, this was the one given to police by the eyewitness Shauna Ornt, working, at, working that night at the Tribune. Mm-hmm. Chuck thought that the sketch looked like himself. Now he now he's really starting to get concerned that he was somehow involved in this murder. Now when when he's at this point when he gets really drunk, he starts telling some people that he thinks he's committed a murder right. or was at least involved in the murder of Kent Heitholt. Well part part of this is you know you're not fully developed your your frontal cortex and all that stuff. I'm not a doctor so but you taking all those drugs, right? It's going to mess up your brain a little bit. And I think, I think this guy took so many drugs, he fried his damn brain. And maybe too often. You know, is it, is it the same thing? Are you beating your brain the same level as like getting multiple concussions over and over again with what he's doing? He's blacking out. 
Yeah, and how many times is he hit in his head when he's drunk too? I mean, that's a, that's another good point. Mm-hmm. So now he's getting really drunk and he starts telling people that he thinks he may have committed the murder or he's least involved in the murder. Well, he, he well, this is definitely not helping, you know, you with your friends there, Chucky. Yeah. You already had this bad reputation. Yeah. Now this guy, you, this guy gets drunk. He breaks furniture. He, he tries to fight people. And then now he's confessing to murders. Don't invite this guy to your party. Rule number one. It's not going to be a good time. It's not going to work out well for you. You're not going to be the popular kid in school. Stop inviting Chucky to the party. It sounds like he only told two people. These were his friends. This That's is because only two people would hang out. What the crazy dude? This is Nick Gilpin and Art Figaro. <laughs> and the thing is, I don't know if the, he told these, these two guys on separate occasions, or you know, if he told them together on several occasions. I'm not certain, but as as I've heard it, he's only told two people. I'm assuming that he told Nick Gilpin this story one time, and then old Captain Gilpin was like, I'm not hanging out with you no more, Chucky. Uh, well, it's through these two friends uh, that Chuck is, is you know, that it's Wait, hold, later. Just, let's hold on for a second. Just think about this way. You're Nick Gilpin, right? Mm -hmm. You're hanging out with Chucky, so you don't have a lot of options, right? Hmm. This guy breaks stuff. Gets in fights, and then he tells you he tells you he murdered somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Or he thinks he did. What? How low do you have to be? How bored? How lonely do you have to be to pick up the phone and say, "Call him up again." I'm, I'm going to call Chucky up and see if he wants to hang out. Uh, you got to be pretty lonely, right? Get some more details about that murder. Uh, well, it's through these two friends that the police are later notified and told that Chuck Erickson. Uh, was one uh, was the one who killed the newspaper reporter or that was involved in the newspaper reporter's death that took place two years ago. Mm -hmm. So in, are you still with me so far in March of 2004? Okay. Well, okay. So we have, we have the, the event happens on, on Halloween. Mm -hmm. Two years later, Chucky's having these dreams. He starts telling people. Starts telling people. They contact the cops. And even if the look, if if somebody gets drunk and starts telling you they murdered somebody, call the cops. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. Um. So they, they call the cops. Now the cops need to talk to Chucky. Yeah. So in March of 2004, the Columbia Police Department they pick up Chuck Erickson and they question him. Mm -hmm. Well, not too long after, and in fact, I believe it was later that same day, they call another police department because. By this time, Ryan was off at uh, junior college, and they have Ryan Ferguson arrested as well. Well, these two questionings by police uh, go very differently. Um, and let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about this starting with Chuck. Okay. okay? So you played uh, some of that interrogation for us. Right. And, you know, you see in the questioning, there's, there's a couple different levels of questioning that take place here. First off, there's some questioning that goes down off camera. There's some that goes down on camera. And there's also a questioning period that takes place on camera where they're driving him to the crime scene and they're driving him around the area. So he can, you know, they can point things out to him and they can kind of ask him, where did you guys come from? Uh, did, did you enter the parking lot this way? Which way right. did you exit? Where did you go after the murder? You know, uh, can you tell us where his car was parked? Things like that. You know, they have to take him there. Well, it, regarding the questioning or slash interrogation of Chuck Erickson, it's, what would you say? It's disconcerting, Captain? It's unethical. So we have a guy here. The problem is, though, they pick this guy up and he's saying, you know, I, maybe I, I maybe I was involved in this thing. I I don't know. It's it's it, I I blacked out that night. I have very little memory. He says something like, uh, he he's seeing almost snapshots uh, right. of of the of the night. Well, they're going to they're going to. It looked to me, Captain, like it started off like kind of a friendly questioning period, and at some point they start getting. You know, we see the typical. Well, yeah, they, well, here's what the detectives do. They like to spread their legs very wide mm -hmm. and they like to get in a little tiny baby chair and then they scoot up really close 
you know, so their whole, you know, cock and balls and everything are right on the guy's knee. And then they're looking deep into their eyes and they start saying stuff like, you need to tell me the truth. You're not telling me the truth. So that, yeah, it starts off friendly. Then they do the whole, let me get right in your grill to a little bit later. They back up. They also, once things are going their way, they like to do the lean back. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Where they, they are starting to get answers. So they do the lean back. Well, and they keep you, they keep you positioned back in the corner. And they they stay right in front of you, in your face. Right, but once they start getting answers, they like to back up and do the lean back. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, let's make this more comfortable for you. And when you're not telling me the truth, I'm going to make it uncomfortable for you. Well, and they're also constantly reminding reminding you that you did this, that you are guilty. Yes. They will emphasize that word you, and they will often point at you when they do that or or touch you in some manner to remind you that is that it is you that is under the microscope. Right. It's not it's not a whole bunch of other people that they're looking at. They have circled in on you. Yeah, so a couple things. One, I feel for the detectives because there's no real leads. They had nothing to go on. All of a sudden, 2 years later, you have this guy Chucky coming forward saying I'm having these dreams. I have a history of blacking out. I might have been involved. Mhm. Okay. So yes, the cops need to get to the bottom of this. So I, I look, I, I normally would say no way, shape or form should you ever feed details. But I think in this case, I'm going to give him a little bit of a pass because this guy is saying, I don't know. I don't know a bunch of the details where I'm not going to give you a pass is once Chucky brings somebody else into the equation. And once he brings up Ryan Ferguson into the equation, your job now is is to, if you want to find out if he's telling you the truth, you need to focus on trying to prove him wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's what they should have done first. I, I'm going to halfway agree with you because it sounds like you're saying if, if it were just Chuck that was that was implicating himself and no one else, that it's fine to give up the details. The, not n- not the, fine to give up all the details. Right, th- because the problem I have with that is the whole purpose of withholding those details is that so you avoid false confessions. And if you start just giving away information, that's really going to help this person, whether they did it or not, uh, get the right answers. Let's right. Say. So where do we have a problem with some of these things? Well, but, but what I'm saying though, is you could drive him to the scene. You could do certain things. Mm-hmm. Uh, may, I, you know, maybe try hypnosis or whatever, just to see if you can to get these memories to come back to the service. But I'm not telling him, I'm not saying that you should say, uh, what the guy was strangled with or details like that. No, definitely not. Right. And in, in the beginning of the questioning or interrogation, it, it appears, uh, and we, we can see it on TV. We see it on the camera footage. Uh, it appears that Erickson, that Chuck has little knowledge of the crime. Um, and at one point he tells the police, I could be sitting here fabricating all of this right now, as the captain was hinting towards there, uh, they want some detailed information. You know, they want to know what did you, what was Kent strangled with? Okay. Um, how many times was he hit? What was he hit with? Okay. So let's yeah. go through that as such. He, he states that they, they took something from Ryan's car and that's what they are going to attack Kent with. And he assumed like a tire iron. Yes. Again. Now, if you hit now, it was, hit about 15 times. If you hit somebody 15 times in the head, the tire iron, there's going to be a skull fracture Mm -hmm. and maybe not Chucky because Chucky's a small guy, but you give a, a pretty good athlete and Ryan Ferguson, a tire iron. There's not going to be skull fractures. It's going to be a mutilated skull. One thing we should point out too, though, to paint a bit of a better picture for everybody is, uh, I would actually, I would actually consider, both Chuck and Ryan to be smaller dudes. Um, you know, I think what Ryan was five, eight, five, nine. Uh, and we have Chuck who's a, who's about five, seven. Um, and, and, and the reason why I say smaller dudes is that's in comparison to Kent Heitholt. Kent Heitholt was well over six foot and he, he was a large dude. He, he played offensive line for, for some college before he became a sports writer. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I understand that they might be armed 
with this tire iron or some blunt object or unknown object. But it, it does seem strange to me that these two teenage boys would pick a very large male victim to, to attempt to rob. Yeah. But Ryan, Ryan was, you know, he's athletic. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly what his height is. Yeah. I, but he, he, he definitely looked very athletic. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so as we were stating, they need to know what he was hit with. And furthermore, who hit him and how many times was he hit with this object? Well, Here's one thing that I found really strange about that interrogation. You saw this. You know, he says, how many times was did was Kent hit? Did you hit Kent? Uh, once. Yeah. And he's like, no, come on. We know, we know uh-huh. Chuck, that he was hit a lot more than one time. Mm-hmm. And then he throws out some other number that's not correct. And then the, the uh, detective corrects him and he says, now we know that Kent, that you hit Kent 15 times. Is that right? And eventually Chuck gives into this and says, yes, I hit him 15 times. Right. And this is what I find is so unethical. Well, not only that, the strange part of this thing here as captain is first of all, it's incredibly unethical. Second of all, the detective fed him information, but fed him wrong information. He yeah. says 15 times the, the autopsy report states 11 or 12 times. The detective didn't even bother to get the wrong, you know, the wrong information, right? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and and so he feeds him some bad information and we have Chuck validate that and corroborate with that and says, yes, you know, yeah. We, yeah, but right, we hit right. him 15 times. But there's a couple times that Chuck is going, you know what? But I don't really know. Mm-hmm. I don't really know if I'm telling you the truth or not. Right. And then then they want to know, OK, what what did you use to strangle Kent? Yeah, I don't know. His T-shirt. Yeah, and actually, I I thought when I viewed the 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 full length of the of the questioning, the interrogation. Yeah, yeah. I I thought that I saw him almost react. He didn't verbally say it, but it, it looked like his his uh, his body language was suggesting that he was about to say his hands. You yeah, know what no, I mean? Like, yeah, because he, yeah, he said, you know, did did Ryan? How did Ryan choke him? Like again, implementing Ryan and not Chucky, and and he makes. I saw Ryan. Uh, hands are, you know, kind of the symbol. Yeah, for he like, makes a gesture you know, about choking with his right, hands. The Homer Simpson, I'm going to choke Bart Simpson type move. So, yeah. And and they were like, no, that's not right. And he's like, well, maybe a t-shirt. Yeah, because he, he states that it, the officer would tell him, you know, it, it, it might have been something of Kent's that was used to to strangle him. And, and right. as you said, at first he says a t-shirt. And he says, no, it wasn't his t-shirt. And then you hear. And this is like questioning like a five-year-old you know that like took a crap on in the family room that, that, that that's what this questioning reminds me of well and then you you hear him say so he says no it wasn't a t-shirt chuck right. then chuck says well maybe it was a bungee cord i don't know because i couldn't see him having a rope in his car right Okay, Doesn't so, make any sense to me <laughs> why he would have a rope in his car yeah. so so all right well let's examine that it obviously wasn't a t-shirt. I, no, no. It starts wasn't with, a, it wasn't with his hands. Right. Wasn't strangled with his hands. He wasn't strangled with a t-shirt. Wasn't strangled with a bungee cord. Wasn't strangled with a rope. And it wasn't something that was taken from the victim's car. It was something that was taken right. off of the victim. Right, right. So after five wrong answers, after five wrong answers, maybe you as a detective should go, hey, this guy doesn't know jack shit. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he does. He doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, but right. So, at what point does the te- does the detective say, "Hey, this is ridiculous. This is nonsense." Not only, and here's what they do: they feed him all this information. They feed Chucky all this information. They get a tape confession. They think maybe this can hold up, and then they pull Ryan Ferguson in. Well, uh, you know, and I'm not even ready to go that far yet because I'm still on the belt thing here. You know, we, the, the officer tells just outright tells him yeah, he, he was strangled with his own belt. Uh, no, no. He sits back with just this cocky son of a bitch type attitude. And he's just sitting back and he goes, I'm, I was kind of holding this from you. I was keeping this back from you. I didn't want to tell you, but it was a belt. That's pretty much exactly what he says, right? Mm-hmm. 
And Chuck says something like, well, I don't remember that at all. Like, he seems surprised, like, that that's the murder weapon. Like, like shocked. Um, no, no. He he doesn't even understand what he's saying. Mm-hmm. Because all of a sudden, then Chuck, he says, wait a second. His, n- With not, his own belt. Right. N- not Ryan's belt, but his own belt? Mm-hmm. Oh, like, flabbergasted. Like, like this is the first time he's thinking somebody pulled up on Kent, knocked him in his head a, a 10 times, 11 times, pulled this dude's belt off of him, strangled him with his own belt. You have to be a vicious SOB to do that. Well, and, and like you said, it's he's his reaction is almost like getting fired up man well chuck's reaction is almost like i'm trying to help you out here guys but i would not have guessed that you know on my best day i would not have guessed his own belt on my best day right so anyway then now they got to figure out what is the motive why would you guys go and attack this large man uh that you don't know in the middle of a parking lot you don't know did nothing to you. And here's the answer that you get. After all, after you go through all of these details, the answer that you get is, well, I guess if we killed him, <laughs> then I assume we would have done it for money. Right. But no sign of robbery. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. This There's- is this is unethical, horrible, horrible police work. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe... Just like, and we'll talk about this later, you know, a, a prosecutor, for example, can't just make up fake evidence, right? right? And there's laws against that. And you can face jail time. Just like I think, you know, now that we require people to tape these interviews, they need to be well aware that if you cross the line or you do some ridiculous dumb shit, that you can face jail time. Mm-hmm. And I believe in this case that these detectives doing the interrogation, they deserve jail time because these interrogations were so unethical. You signed up to serve and protect, not to make up bullshit lies and put innocent people behind bars. Well, the thing here is when they're talking to Ryan Ferguson, it's a much different story. You know, uh, we have we have Ryan Ferguson basically denying everything. Well, do you, do you want to just hear that clip? Yeah. I did not do anything. I did not see anything. But and I'm here for murder. Like, I didn't do shit. Chuck says that he got kind of sick to his stomach after he hit this guy. During that time, uh, he looks over and sees you on top of the, the guy who's down, and you're choking him out. He says strangling him. You, you believe this? I, 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 I believe Chuck probably had something to do with it. Well, he said it's had there. All right, well, I mean, he could have very well have been a part of it. I'm not. He would calm us up when we come down there. We started talking about the murder. You're like, no, I didn't do it. wasn't there. You don't know what you're talking about. The police pull me and say, we're going to talk to you about a murder. I'm going to be getting about half crazy. I am f-ing half crazy, dude. I'm sorry I'm good at f-ing hiding my emotions. F-ing. I'm shaking like a knee figure. I didn't do anything. I'm about to get in trouble for something I didn't do. All right, so that's uh, l- little pieces of the Ryan Ferguson interrogation. I got to tell you, Captain, I watched that thing, and I thought that Ryan actually held it together pretty well, mm-hmm. um, not in a way that would imply to me that he's guilty, like the detective was trying to point out, um, you know, stating that, oh, if somebody pulled me in for murder, I'd be mad as hell. Well, uh, what's crazy to me is He does he- appear to be mad as hell to me. Yeah, but in, um, in a, I think a mature way i mean one you're getting a question about a night that happened two two years ago mm-hmm. so think about that night might be very insignificant to you and then somebody's questioning you about it and you're going well i, I don't really remember because and the reason why i say that he appears to be mad at times you know but 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 controlled right is Mature. that you see him at times where there's like a split second where he'll he'll smack the table and he's like man i'm yep. telling you i've told you a hundred times I didn't do this. I wasn't there. I don't know what else I can say. Mm-hmm. And then second of all, you'll see a couple times where he will raise his voice to the detectives, basically making the same argument. I don't know how to tell you this any differently than I was not there. Right. You know, but 
But what drives me nuts, and I, I've said this, I think, since we started looking into this case, is when you watch these these tapes, uh, Chucky doesn't make any damn sense, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the detectives make n- no damn sense at all. The only one that's not in this crazy make-believe world is is Ryan. He's, he's, he seems like the only one that is is speaking with any logical sense. Right. So, I mean, just like with the detectives, if you can't get Chucky to remember anything or if all of his details are different and conflicting of the evidence that you know and that you have studied, he's not your guy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it makes zero logical sense to keep pursuing down that road. And I like that he says, you know, at some point he kind of gives in because he says, you know, every time he says, I didn't do this. I wasn't there. Well, then at some point the police start coming back with the argument. Well, well, Chuck was there and we know Chuck did this and you were with Chuck and his, his answer is the same every time he goes, okay, well fine. Maybe Chuck did do this. Maybe right. Chuck was there. I was not right. I didn't do this. And then, you know, he, he's asked, you see that part where the, um, the one detective comes in and he tries to play the good cop, you know, Oh, I have a son your age. And when I, when I look at you, I'm seeing my son. So I'm here to, I'm yeah. here to help you get this off your chest. And I'm here to help you talk about this. You know, sometimes we do things that we don't mean to do right? And for whatever reason. We don't know why we do them, you know, but he sticks with it. You know, Ryan is, is, sticks with it. He says, yeah, I would have said, Hey, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not a douche like your son, but I didn't do this. The, the thing here is, you know, not only did I, not only, only am I innocent of the murder, I'm innocent of having even been there. Yeah, and never was even there. Now, the police, they're stuck in this bad situation, okay? You know, it, it obviously looks like Ryan's in a bad situation and Chuck is in a bad situation. But the police, unbeknownst to the two boys, the police, they need something. Because as we pointed out earlier, you know, they, they don't have a lot to go on other than this confession that they've got from this Chuck Erickson. Mm-hmm. And then the person that's supposedly with him, Ryan Ferguson, is saying the exact opposite. I was not there. I'm not guilty of anything. They need someone to somewhat back up Chuck's story. Okay, so who who would have... Well, and also their story. It's a collaborative story at this point. You're exactly right. Who would have seen you there that night? Oh, mm-hmm. well, you know, Chuck points out that... At some point after the murder, while we were leaving and going on on our way back to the bar at this intersection, we saw this guy that we knew, and his name is his name is Dallas Mallory. We saw him. He was at a red light in a vehicle with two girls. I had a brief conversation with him at the intersection before the light turned green, and he took off. Well, they bring in this Dallas Mallory, and he says, mm, "I did not see." Those, I did not see Chuck. I did not see Ryan. I saw neither of those guys at an intersection in the early morning hours of November 1st. He goes on to say, I didn't see those guys on Halloween night either. Mm-hmm. Well, the police keep coming back to him and they say, well, we know, Dallas, we know that you saw them because Chuck keeps saying that he saw you, that he had a conversation with you. And at some point, Dallas is saying, you know, like you pointed out, Captain, this is at least two years ago. So Dallas is like, he's confused. He's like, well, how about this? If Chuck says he saw me, then what was I wearing that night? Well, they go to Chuck and they talk to Chuck and Chuck says, well, Dallas was dressed up for Halloween to go to the Halloween parties. He was dressed up as a police officer. Mm-hmm. And of course the, uh, the detectives go back to Dallas Mallory and they say, he says he saw you, you were dressed like a police officer. And Dallas Mallory says, Hmm, I was, I was wearing a police uniform that night. That was my character for the Halloween parties. Uh, then, then I must, if he says that that's what I was wearing, then I must've seen those guys that night. Right. Cause how would he know? Mm-hmm. So now that they have somebody backing up Chucky's story and their story, their combined efforts to create this elaborate story, they're going to charge Chucky and then they're going to go on trial to charge Ryan Ferguson. Yeah. And, and I think let's cover that in tomorrow's episode. We we should talk about how this gets to trial. Talk about the trial itself. 
the things that they got right, the things they got wrong, and where this ends up getting us in the end. Well, yeah, tons to dive in tomorrow. Until then, check out truecrimegarage.com. Go to the store page. We got the tank tops for sale. We got the V-necks. We got the logo tees, some beer mugs, a bunch of different stuff. Check that out. All right, we will see everybody back here tomorrow in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let it. Thank you.